Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back to our session. Uh, so our session is, is entitled uh, Central Bank Operational Frameworks. And of course, this is a central theme, uh, in particular for us here at the ECB these days, with a review of our operational framework in uh, full speed. So the papers that will be presented in this session, but I would say more generally the papers presented in the conference, the keynote speeches, and also the market panel will provide key inputs that we would be gratefully taking into account for the completion of the operational framework review. Uh, my name is Thomas Vlasopoulos. I'm Deputy Director General for Market Operations. I'll be chairing uh, this session. And uh, our session has two papers that have a very clear link between them. They, they both tackle the question of the demand uh, for reserves. And this is, in fact, a key question uh, for, uh, for central banks. It's a key question be, uh, both in terms of uh, managing the transition away from uh, central banks' QE portfolios, but also for um, helping and informing the choice of the steady state operational framework and the uh, resulting balance sheet size and, and composition. And in a way, the two papers are complementary because the first paper um, focuses very much on bank uh, re demand for reserves, whereas the second paper also addresses the uh, demand for liquidity by non-bank financial intermediaries, and in fact shows that uh, this can be, uh, in some uh, environments and conditions, uh, a more decisive factor for um, uh, determining when the balance sheet shrinkage can stop. Now, let me turn to our uh, four speakers for uh, this afternoon, and let me start with Annette. Annette Wissing Jorgensen will be our first uh, uh, presenter uh, this afternoon. She is a senior advisor at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, but of course, she has a long and distinguished career also in, in academia. And to discuss uh, Annette's pa uh, paper, we have uh, joining us virtually online uh, Stefano Corradin from the ECB's uh, research department. And our second uh, presenter this afternoon is also from the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, Sria Anbil, uh, and who's a, a group manager in the Division of uh, Monetary Affairs. And finally, to discuss Sria's papers, paper, uh, we, we, are, we are pleased to um, have uh, Professor Rafael Repulo from, uh, from SEMFI and Director of, uh, of SEMFI and, and of course a, a leading uh, authority in banking and bank regulation but also uh, monetary policy and monetary policy implementation in particular. So um, let's move immediately uh, without further delay to the first paper. Annette, the floor is yours. You have 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so today I'd like to talk about banks' demand for central bank reserves. And I should say this is joint work with David Lopez Salido, whom you hopefully did not see present the same paper here at a different ECB conference a few weeks ago. Um, importantly, since there's some, uh, some numbers at the end, uh, these are just my views and David's views. The usual disclaimer applies. Um, all right. So. Thinking about the role of reserves in U.S. monetary policy, if you think back to before the financial crisis, the Fed was in a system where reserves didn't earn interest. There was no IOR. Therefore, reserve demand was low. Uh, reserve supply was low even relative to, dem to demand in the sense that there was a very sharp res reserve scarcity. And this allowed the Fed to change the equilibrium short market rate by very small amounts, plus minus a couple of billions, was enough to, to have a large impact on the equilibrium market rate. Fast forward to the financial crisis, a zero lower bound became binding. The Fed and other central banks went into unconventional policies with forward guidance and QE. With QE, reserve supply expanded massively and also the Fed started paying interest on reserves, of course, something that the ECB had already been doing uh, for a long time before that. So our focus here is how exactly does the, the Fed, which is our focus, control the equilibrium interest rate in this new ample reserve setting? And secondly, and very related, how can we use uh, an understanding of reserve demand to think about quantitative tightening? And here we're going to take uh, an interest rate volatility perspective and try to estimate that point of curvature 
of where uh, you start seeing increases in equilibrium rate uh, being pretty large, uh, you know, for a given size of uh, supply reduction. I want to say I've taken a different angle in my paper for the ACB Sinto conference this year uh, for thinking about this, this QT issue, which was saying, okay, let's start by observing that the central bank doesn't really need a particular balance sheet size in order to hit a given uh, policy stance when it can pay interest rate on reserves. So effectively with the balance sheet, you can do one more thing, which could be, for example, uh, supplying a lot of safe and liquid reserves, uh, sort of following the Friedman rule logic. In the paper, a key point, uh, in that paper, a key point is that one should also think about the assets that the central bank holds. So not only do you add safety and liquidity when you supply reserves, but you may also take away safety and convenience if you buy German bonds or US treasuries as a central bank. All right, so back to the current paper. Uh, I'm going to do this in two steps. First, I lay out a framework for thinking about the demand, also the supply of reserves, about the equilibrium and also the question of interest rate control. And then uh, I'm going to estimate this out empirically and then get back to thinking about uh, what, it, what it says in terms of what can we do with this from the perspective of actual policy. And there's going to be two useful uh, outputs, hopefully. One will be we're going to be able to construct a schedule for how to set the interest rate and reserve as a function of the balance sheet size if you want to hit a given target. That's called the ISO Fed funds rate curve. The second one will be uh, we can estimate how much QT is feasible from an interest rate volatility perspective. All right, so just since we are you know, not at the Fed, let's just quick recap of the moving parts of the Fed's balance sheet. On the asset size, side, treasuries, MBS uh, are the main ones. Uh, loans are relatively small, so this is unlike the ECB, uh, which historically supplied more of its reserves through lending to banks, and of course later has also uh, added the, a large securities portfolio. On the liability side, um, the Fed and other central banks supplies their assets by funding it with the autonomous factors, that's currency and the government deposits called the Treasury General Account in the US. And then with, uh, in blue, the interest bearing, deposit, the interest -bearing liabilities reserves which you can think of as just banks checking account with the Fed, and then the overnight reverse repo facility, which you can think of investments by non-banks with the Federal Reserve, typically uh, money market funds uh, in the form of repo. All right, so uh, to put the paper in perspective, the black line here graphs out the total size of the Fed's balance sheet. You can see it goes up a lot more than it goes down. There was around a quantitative tightening in 2018, 2019, it's already come up. You know, it, it didn't end maybe as well as, as uh, one could hope with a big spike in short market, in short market interest rates suggesting perhaps too much reserve scarcity. And where the paper fits in, of course, is in this latest round of QT, which you can see is well underway. All right, I don't, this is a, you guys already know the yield spikes. Okay, so reserve demand, we'll do with demand, supply, and equilibrium. So reserve demand, uh, going back to the basics of banking, comes from banks' liquidity management problems. So if you think about narrow banking, the banks will back their deposits one for one with reserves. If you think about fractional reserve banking, the banks will back their deposits with some fraction of that being put into reserves. And where we are now is in this ample reserves banking, where we're not totally sure how the reserve demand function looks. Um, but nonetheless, you know, from this, it should be clear that a key input, of course, should be how big is a banking sector, which we are going to process here by deposits. And then, of course, something about the, how expensive it is for the banks to hold reserves. All right, so our framework is going to be sort of pretty reduced form, but hopefully enough uh, that we can take it to the data. There's going to be four main ingredients. The first one will be that the Fed pays interest on reserves. The second one will be the reserves have liquidity benefits. You could think of these as coming from the fact that if a bank has reserves and faces a deposit outflow, then it can satisfy that outflow without incurring any cost of selling assets or you know, delaying payments in the extreme. Uh, I'm going to use V to denote the convenience value. So that's like the total dollar value of having reserves. Think of this as an expected savings from having reserves and thus not having to incur, incur all the costs. And then the key element here will be the derivative of V with respect to the reserves. Uh, but that's what we call the convenience yield, and that's the marginal value of an additional uh, reserves. It's going to be decreasing in reserves, presumably, as more and more reserves are less and less useful. It's going to be increasing in deposits, as an additional dollar of reserves is more useful for managing a large amount of deposits. The third feature will be bank balance sheet costs, which, for simplicity, will have uh, just as a constant fraction of assets 
those are in there to capture the empirical fact that oftentimes we see short market rates going below the IOR, which is something one can get out with the balance sheet cost. Finally, and this is some, quite related to Sria's paper, uh, we're going to have a cost of, of uh, posting collateral in repo transactions so that I can speak not just to the Fed funds rate but also to repo rates. I'll capture that with a W function. You could think of uh, that cost as capturing foregone securities lending revenues if you have to post the collateral in repo borrowing rather than being able to lend it out. All right, so with that, you can think of the reserve demand function just as coming from the bank's first order condition for borrowing to hold the reserves. So in that little bank profit expression, there's three rows. The first one is interest income. The second one is interest expense. The third one is from these various features that I already talked through. Okay, so suppose we define reserve demand, and that'll be our focus as coming from the first order condition for borrowing in the Fed funds market and holding reserves then the reserve demand curve simply tra traces out the highest interest rate the bank is willing to pay to borrow, that's on the left hand side, uh, as a function of how many reserves are held. And the willingness to pay is just going to be the net benefit of reserves, which comes from the fact that interest pay, reserves pay interest. You can think of that as a store of value motivation for holding reserves. And then the convenience yield from the liquidity benefits. And then thirdly, the balance sheet cost. There's going to be many different first order conditions one could look at. So linking again to Sria's paper would link mostly to the last one, of, or to the second one of how much will the bank pay in the repo market to borrow to hold reserves. There, that's going to be that additional term that has to do with the cost of posting collateral. So you, when you think about reserve demand, you can think of it being relative to whatever source of funding, and thus you know the y-axis would change in your graph, but the intuition is always the same. All right, so. Graphing this out, you can see then that reserve demand is just money demand for banks. Uh, the reserve demand function is downward sloping because this convenience shield is declining in reserves. The up vertical dimension is determined by the interest rate on reserves minus the balance sheet cost. And the line's going to asymptote to the IOR minus fee if the convenience shields go to zero. So there's some saturation uh, eventually. All right, moving on to supply. The reserve supply, uh, you can think of in terms of just the Fed's balance sheet, a simplified version is put here, where the starting point, especially in the Fed case, is that the Fed buys some securities and has to pay for them. Um, some of the securities are paid for by the autonomous factors, and the rest with reserves. So the starting point for how large reserves will be will be securities minus autonomous factors. We're going to call that net securities. Now, if the central bank here, the Fed, has a lending facility, then, of course, that's another way to supply security, to supply reserves. And on the other hand, if the central bank has an investment facility for non-banks, the ONRP facility in the first case, well, that's going so to reduce the amount of uh, reserves funding that the Fed needs and will thus be subtracted. So reserves is basically net securities plus loans to banks minus whatever reserves the central bank has taken in, in the form of the ONRP. All right, so if you graph this out, uh, I'm going to distinguish the cases with and without the ONRP facility, since both are in, in our sample. If uh, there's no ONRP facility, then the supply curve sort of starts out at a vertical line of equal to net securities, and then the Fed stands willing to add further reserves at the uh, Lending facility rate, which at the Fed, of course, is the interest rate in this economy, you know, the primary credit rate. So the supply curve is vertical and then becomes flat. If there's the ONRP facility, well, then the, the Fed doesn't just stand ready to add reserves, but also to subtract reserves. And so then you get this second flat part, as illustrated in the right picture, uh, at the ONRP rate. OK, so then throwing these two guys into the same picture, you can see that basically there's three things that can happen with the equilibrium depending on where the demand curve intersects the supply curve. So the simplest case is one where the demand intersects the supply on the vertical part. Their reserves are just equal to the net securities. Uh, the second case, sorry, in this case, neither the, the discount window nor the one IP facility is used, and the case is the simplest one. Alternatively, it could be the case, as it is in a lot, in, in, in a lot of the sample, 
uh, post GFC that the demand curve hits the supply curve on the bottom flat part. So there, so that's going to basically happen. You know, you can sort of play around with moving the demand curve around. If there's not enough demand relative to supply, then there's going to be take up at the ONIP facility. And the way that that's going to show up in the picture is that reserves will be less than net securities. And the difference will be the ONRP facility, which I have called the non-bank facility, as indicated on the axis. And this, of course, sort of shows you why the ONRP facility was introduced. It's a way to make sure that the market equilibrium interest rate doesn't fall below uh, the floor set by the ONRP rate. All right, so the third possible equilibrium is one where the reserve demand crosses supply at the top flat part of supply. So in that case, the banking sector is going to borrow more reserves uh, from, the, from the Fed through these loans to banks, and you can see where that shows up on the horizontal axis. So this is going to happen if there's a lot of demand relative to supply. Uh, formally, it's going to happen if demand evaluated at the lending facility rate exceeds the supply, the net security supply, then you can see take up at the, at the discount window. All right, so in terms of just what have we learned about interest rate control from this simple framework, uh, the central bank controls a short market interest rate through a bunch of different uh, channels. The first one is, is, is the vertical part of the supply curve, the net securities, but then also through controlling, importantly, the demand curve, the IOR, which, remember, shifts the demand curve just up and down. The flat parts on the supply curves also can matter if demand is really low or really high. So basically, all the three administered rates matter. Um, and it's also important to emphasize that the private sector plays a key role here in terms of actually using these facilities and thus facilitating either a reduction or an increase in, uh, in reserves. All right, so let me turn to estimating this out, and I'm going to focus on the post-GFC sample. So to do this, uh, David and I, we assume a log functional form for the convenience yield so that it's log linear in reserves and deposits. And then we throw in a reserve demand shock, and then you get to the red estimating equation in the middle. If you wanted to link this back to sort of more old school money demand literature, you can reorganize it and solve for reserves. And then you'll see the equation in blue, which tells you this is what you know, Bob Lucas would have called a semi-log money demand function. All right, so I wanted to just emphasize a few points about the estimation. The first one being the importance of controlling for deposits. So deposits have gone up. Uh, they have gone up even relative to GDP, but the important part here is that they have gone up just in dollar terms. That started before the financial crisis and, and has kept going, um, driven by, in the right picture, in red, an increase in liquid deposits, which are sort of the most reserve intensive intents to manage. Okay, the second point about the estimation is that we need to instrument for reserves. Okay, you probably already caught that one because if the demand curve hits the supply curve on the bottom flat part, then if you start moving around the demand curve, that there's a reserve demand shock, the split of net securities between reserves and the ONRP will change. So that's a no-no for OLS because then you have a reserve demand shock affects reserves, so you can't run OLS. So we instrument reserves with the sum of reserves plus ONRP, which is equal to net securities uh, when the lending to banks is small. We also, in the paper, instrument for deposits. I'm going to skip that here because it doesn't change the results much. But it's import what's important is to control for deposits because they go up over time, uh, but not to instrument for them. OK, so the estimation result uh, then starts with the first stage of the IV estimation to the right. Not surprisingly, reserves plus ONRP is a very strong instrument for reserves. And more importantly, to the left, you can see that we get the expected signs for example, the, the, the coefficient of log reserves is negative. That's why we got the downward sloping demand. It says the convenience yield is declining in the reserve amount. And then we get the positive coefficient on deposits, saying that the value of additional reserves is higher if the banking sector is larger, essentially. It, translating it into that semi-log money demand, uh, one can calculate that a 10 basis point drop in the Fed Fund's IOR spread leads banks to be willing to hold 50% more reserves. So the reserve demand is very elastic, but it's not flat despite the large reserves in much of the sample. All right, so 
just to show you that the fit is really nice, it's actually easier to focus on the reduced form of the IV, which directly links the left-hand side variables to the instruments. And you see the R, the R squared here from this you know, incredibly simple model is like 90%. And the fit is good throughout the sample, as shown in the figure to the right. A way to summarize the estimation is to graph out the implications of the reduced form. And here I want to contrast the raw data to the left with the estimation result to the right. So in the data, um, I have to the left the fat funds IR spread graphed against reserves plus O and RP. Um, you can see that it's trying to look like a downward sloping demand curve, but it's like something is pulling it out over time. And that's just, we argue, with the growth of the banking sector over time. Once you control for that, which I have done by rewriting the estimation equation in red into the one in blue to define supply adjusted for deposits, so adjusted for the need for supply, uh, and then change that to put the x-axis, to put that variable on the x-axis, you can see now there's a pretty nice fit. Notice also from that top point that the estimation is not surprised by September uh, 2019 in the sense that given the reserve plus owner P supply at the time and the amount of deposits at the time, the regression tells us that that's when reserves were the scarcest over the sample and thus the actual and the predicted spread the highest. All right, so just a word about why deposits went up. So we think that a key channel here is that there is there was, household just had more financial assets to invest. So if you do like household portfolio theory 101, generally households will put some in cash, um, think of that as deposits, some in bonds, some in stocks. So if they have more money to invest, you would get higher reserve demand. Uh, in the left picture here, I'm showing you household financial assets to GDP. Um, you can see it's going up uh, dramatically. The right figure is the portfolio share for deposits, which in the post-GFC period is sort of amazingly stable around 16, 17%. So that, that sort of immediately tells you what might be a good instrument for deposits. It's the household financial assets. We also use the level of interest rates so we can do an OVID test, but the, the main strength is coming from financial assets. So just to flag, if you do the, if you do the estimation instrumenting both for reserves and deposits, you can see the fit again is, is good. All right, so then, Let's think about what this all implies for policy. And let's start with uh, how to set the interest rate and reserves. Okay, so to summarize the estimation, um, in the left picture, I'm graphing what is the predicted spread coming out of the IV reduced form given deposits at the end of the sample. Okay, so the estimation ends, we're in the middle of updating, but the estimation here ends in 2022 uh, months 10. So deposits were about 17 point some trillion. If you plug that in, you have the estimated coefficients A, B, and C. You can trace out the predicted spread for various values of reserves plus ONRP. That's what all those little red dots are. And the gray area is the range of data used in estimation. Okay, so now that says we have a pretty good handle on how the Fed funds IR spread moves with supply. So from that, then we can think about how to set the interest rate and reserves to hit a desired target given the balance sheet size. So for example, in the right picture, I have illustrated it uh, for a case where the Fed, uh, wanna, want, they want the effective Fed funds rate to clear near 4%. So intuitively, um, what this, uh, the, sorry, the way to achieve this depends on the size of the balance sheet. So for example, uh, look at the left side of the gray area. Suppose the Fed had a balance sheet around 700 billion then reserves would be quite scarce. So if the Fed had a reserve plus ONRP of 700 billion, then reserves would be quite scarce and there would be a pretty large positive spread. Therefore, if you want the Fed funds rate to clear at 4%, you need to shade the IOR down to allow for the spread. And that's what you can see in the right picture. It comes out to like 3.75 or something like that uh, at the left part of the picture. Conversely, if the Fed had a really large balance sheet well, then the Fed funds IR spread would be negative, and therefore to hit a 4% Fed funds target, you need to set the IOR higher than the, than the, the 4% uh, target. Okay, so 
this red line to the right has a name. We call it the ISOFET funds curve. That's a terminology borrowed from a very good theory paper in Econometrica by Bianchi and Biggio. Uh, and we think this is sort of one of the first empirically estimated, uh, hopefully the first uh, Fed funds curve uh, for the US, ISOFET funds curve for the US. All right, the other thing we can speak to is how much QT is feasible before we might get the, to the point where there's a lot of curvature in reserve demand. And the left picture here is reserves plus ONRP in dollars, and the right one scales by GDP just because that's how a lot of people think about it. In both pictures, the rightmost line is where we are at the end of the sample. Uh, that's, that was at a reserve plus ONRP supply of about 5.3 trillion as of last week. We are now down to 4.4. Um, and then we, we use our estimated reduced form to think about how large the predicted value would be for various counterfactual levels of a surplus ONRP supply. Okay, so for example, um, let's start with possibility two. So we estimate that if the surplus ONRP was reduced to about 2.84 trillion, which is around 11% of GDP, you know, substantially below today's level, then the predicted spread would be the same as in September 2019, which was around three basis points. That's the second line from the left in both pictures. Um, so what this tells you is that one thing that, for example, would be quite risky from an interest rate volatility perspective would be for the Fed to run down a reserve plus ONRP all the way down to 7% of GDP, which it did uh, going into September 2019. That's the leftmost line in both pictures, and that would lead to substantially more reserve scarcity than in September 19. Intuitively, because even though in both cases reserves of GDP was around 7%, the banking sector has just grown in terms of deposits since then. So 7% of GDP is much scarcer now than it was back then. So if you're concerned that, that even option two might be might be too scarce given how September 19 turned out. Uh, you could consider larger values and we consider a third option, for example, one would be where you said the predicted spread to zero, that works out to about 3.3 trillion in reserve plus ONRP. Importantly, these are not numbers that are constant over time. As I have said many times, uh, the banking sector grows over time, so these numbers are gonna evolve with deposits. This is easy to account for. You just update the little blue deposit numbers before you draw the pictures. This is something one can do on an ongoing basis. All right, so then just to, I can move the slides since I'm out of time. So <laughs> that's fair. So let me just say, um, remember that since the autonomous factors are very volatile, if you wanna keep the reserve plus ONRP equal to whatever number you like best here, uh, if, if autonomous, on, with the autonomous flag factors fluctuate, you need to change the overall asset size correspondingly in order to make sure that uh, an increase in the autonomous factors doesn't suddenly push the answer below the number that you have here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annette. Right on time. And uh, let's move to uh, Stefano online. We'll provide a discussion of the paper. Stefano, welcome. You have uh, 15 minutes for your discussion. Yes, let me share the slides. Uh, do you see my slides? Not yet. There we go, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. <coughs> Uh, let me start uh, with the usual uh, disclaimer. disclaimer that these views are expressed here um, and not necessarily reflect the one of the ECB and the US system. And I take also the opportunity to thank colleagues uh, in the research market operation and monetary policy directorate for the discussion that I had uh, on the topic on the reserve demand and on this paper. Uh, the main reason is that um, uh, the first time I read this paper was uh, more than one year ago, uh, because essentially the paper raised so many questions that also inside the ECB we started also to look at the paper to try to see whether we could replicate some of these facts for the euro area. So my presentation will be structured in two parts. First, I will have like main, three main comments on, on the paper, 
then I will share uh, some of the numbers or the exercise that we did for the euro area. I think that the novelty here of this paper is that you derive there is a reserve demand from a bank optimization problem where the deposits are a key variable. And so the idea here is that, uh, you know, reserves earn an interest, but on top of that, they also they provide a convenience that is due to transaction cost savings. So essentially, when the banks uh, face a deposit outflow, instead of selling securities of uh, liquidating loans, they can just use the reserves. And the main advantage of the framework that is proposed here in this paper is essentially that they provide parameters for the wide range of US reserves, so you, you can recover the entire demand function. And you know, you can run, uh, as uh, Aneta did in the last part of her presentation, also some policy exercise. And of course, the big question here is that to try to assess the quantitative tightening, you want to reduce reserves, but at the same time, you want to keep control uh, on the short term rates. So, the key ingredient here is this a convenience yield that is a defined as a sort of benefit function that is going to depend on reserves and deposits. You can also interpret as a sort of minus a cost function. And the idea is quite simple. So more reserves reduce the price of reserves, more deposits are going to increase the price of reserves because essentially the cost of liquidity management is going up. And so the reserve demand is derived from very this simple and elegant equilibrium relation. On the left -hand side, uh, you have the marginal cost of borrowing in the federal fund markets. This is going to be the federal fund rate. And on the right hand side, you have the marginal benefit of holding reserves. And now here you have a three components. The first one is the classic interest on reserves paid by the Fed. The second one is the contribution is this marginal liquidity benefit from additional reserves. Minus you have a marginal cost of regulation. Here regulation penalizes uh, the balance sheet expansion. Now, to estimate uh, uh, this equation one, what you need is you need to define this benefit function. And this is the key ingredient. So the choice here is just to have these log linear firms. So the reserves and deposits enter separately. And, you know, if you want to take a more traditional approach, it would have been that, you know, to have just one variable that is reserve scaled by the deposits. In this case, it's like in this look money demand uh, model, you have the classic uh, uh, both reserves and deposits uh, double. Here, the choice by the authors is different. Uh, I think that the main advantage, uh, this, this is my understanding for reading the paper, respect to, uh, of the choice one, is in terms of model fitting. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's quite remarkable to see, you know, on the left hand side, the reserve demand. So it looks quite unstable. Uh, but then when you control for deposits, uh, the model fit is a super tight. The yeah, square is super high. And you know, on the right hand side, essentially is the figure that you have in the paper. Here I'm just plotting uh, the, the fitted values with the blue line. And then the red line is the effective fund rate minus the investment uh, interest on reserves. And you can see that the fit is very nice. Now, <clears throat> this is my first comment. Um, I think the, the point of what I find uh, quite interesting is that, you know, the implied elasticity of deposits is 1.79. So essentially what these estimates are telling us is that the price of reserves is more sensitive to deposits than to reserves. Now, these deposits is this a second additional variable. So my question is, I find a little bit, to some extent, surprising and interesting to see such large sensitivities of deposits take into account that also deposits are larger uh, than reserves. Um, I wonder whether it's due also maybe to the functional form that is chosen, but I think uh, uh, this elasticity is a knowledge, but this to some extent is not uh, really discussed. The second comment uh, is more about uh, the, whether this relation uh, um, is unstable or there is more than one regime. Here I'm referring it to this paper uh, by New York Fed, the force of John Donner, Spadden Williams, I think the paper was presented two years ago here at the same conference. And if you look at this uh, paper, they essentially they discuss uh, three regimes over the same sample. Um, for example, if you take the reserves over bank assets, this is the left hand side panel, you can clearly see these are three regimes. So in the first regime is a sort of expansion from 2010 to 2014. And then you go from 2015 to mid 
multi with a contraction, and then you have an expansion again. It's quite interesting. I really like the chart on the right hand side when now you look at this uh, uh, reserve demand. And you know, it uh, doesn't look anymore to some extent very unstable, but what you see essentially is that you see um, three curves, not one. Uh, and what is nice and interesting is that the location of this reserve demand has shifted over time. Now, of course, reading this paper, one could say, well, it's just, you know, deposits are the only demand curve shifter or the main one. Uh, but I guess the, the, there can be potentially, there might be also other factors that can explain this shift in the location of demand that you see on the right hand side panel. I think in that regard, it's quite interesting also to see this recent paper by uh, Lagos and Navarro that they use a sort of quantitative uh, theory-based approach to assess how variation and key parameters can rationalize uh, this shifting demand that you see on the right-hand side. Overall, I think that the question is, uh, you know, what drives this convenience yield? And, you know, one potential candidate can be, uh, to some extent, is regulation, right? So the regulation here, if you look at the model, is a reduced form is a sort of linear cost that penalizes uh, expansion, and essentially the result in the demand curve is just a shift down. Uh, but you know, if you read a lot of policy documentation, you talk to colleagues in policy, you know, most of the time you hear this argument that you know banks might have precautionary reserve motives to comply with the liquidity regulation. This is why they hold large amount of reserves. Uh, secondly, if you look, for example, also the liquidity coverage duration requirement, also banks might have a preference for meeting uh, this requirement using reserves instead of other HQLA um, assets. So I would like to see maybe a little bit of more discussion also in the paper about other potentially, uh, potential drivers uh, for this demand of reserves. Let me move uh, uh, to the second part, uh, to the application to the euro area. And I think here I'm talking again about uh, regimes, uh, because usually what we have in mind in the ECB is like free regimes. You have the regime before Lehman, uh, that was like a sort of neutral allotment with low and stable excess reserves. And then you have a second regime moving from October 2008 to February 2015, where we moved uh, to the fixed rate full allotment with the moderate excess reserve. Now, what is key here is that the liquidity is endogenously determined by banks' needs, the LTO, for example. And then you have the third period where, you know, this, uh, uh, there is this injection of large amount of excess reserve via QE, uh, PSPP, and PEP, and then TLTOs. Now, if I look now at the evolution of reserves and deposits, I think it's quite interesting to notice also for the euro area that there is a strong movement uh, between excess reserves and uh, deposits, in particular in the, in the last period, since March 2015, uh, yeah, it's almost a correlation of 92%. That can be also, to some extent, can raise some challenges when you estimate the model. I, you know, if I take the model and try to estimate then on this subsample, I think what is interesting to notice is that, uh, so I run always the regression with the log reserves, and then I add also uh, deposits in the second and the fourth column. What you can see is that <clears throat> there is this positive coefficient associated with deposit in the second uh, period from 2008 to 2015. It's also quite interesting to see how the elasticity of the reserves is changing. So to some extent, this is um, provide to some extent some supportive evidence also for the framework for the euro area. But when you move to the last period, maybe because here the world is too flat, you know, you don't see much going on. Um, deposits do not play much a role. Now, I have to say that, you know, just taking the model here and running the regression, of course, is one possibility. Uh, but I think, uh, and it's quite clear also from the paper that, you know, you need to take into account seriously also the institutional context when you apply this type of framework. I think it, uh, we had also in the third of um, this uh, March 2015 period, also the two-tier system for remunerating excess reserves. This is easy to take into account in this regression to some extent, it's not going to change much, but this is my view also. I think there are two factors that are quite interesting in the euro area. First of all, you know, when you take the framework um, and, you know, instead of applying to just to the aggregate euro area, you apply to the countries, uh, 
maybe to the four major one, you can see that this elasticity can change. And finally, that is, I think for me, is a very important channel that also was discussed during the conference that, you know, the banks receive reserves on when they borrow from the US system for their refinancing operation, the ATKLTOs. This is a very important uh, channel. Of course, you want to include that in the framework, but I think here the main difficulty is, is that you need to find also a good instrument for that uh, when you want to apply uh, this uh, additional channel. Uh, let me conclude. I think definitely this is a must read paper. Uh, I have to admit that it's not the first time that also my policy work is triggered by a paper by Annette. I bet it's not going to be the last one. <laughs> and uh, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, Annette, would you like to come back to some of the points made by Stefano? Yeah, he makes a very good point about that the elasticity reserve demand with respect to deposits is higher than one. Um, I, if you put in, we really should have done this liquid deposits rather than total deposits. They co you know, liquid deposits are the ones that really necessitate liquidity management as opposed to time deposits. Uh, then that elasticity is much closer to one, so we'll do that in the next version of the paper. That's also much more consistent with what you get in cross-sectional regressions and what you would expect, you know, some kind of homothetic Um In terms of the the supervision and regulation, I think is is sort of an important point you bring up in terms of why is there such a high, you know, demand for reserves. You know, which you, for li from liquidity management, also in the paper you mentioned by Lagos and Navarro, they sort of argue that just like managing cash, managing deposit flows, you know, you wouldn't expect that much reserve demand. Um, it's possible that we just got lucky that, you know, the LCR says you have to hold liquidity as a function of deposits. You put in deposits and it's working great. So that's obviously hard to distinguish from the liquidity management motive. Maybe you don't need to as a central bank. If you're just trying to figure out when reserves are scarce, maybe this is fine, but of course, from an, from an uh, academic perspective, it's important. Um, in terms of the comparison to the paper by Afonso and others, the reason that they find a need to have time-bearing parameters, I think it's because they put in reserves to assets. I suspect that if they had put in reserves relative to liquid deposits, they could get by with much more stable parameters over time. Then they would essentially be back to the specification that we had, aside from taking the log. Uh, in terms of the comparison with ECB, in the center paper, I do try to estimate this out for the ECB, and you, you're correct that this is econometrically harder because research and deposits are much higher, much more correlated in the euro area than in the US, so it's just econometrically difficult. Uh, the Bank of England has a great blog post where they try out uh, this framework on, on their data, and they find actually a good fit um, and also a higher coefficient, when I ran it on the, on the Bank of England data, a higher coefficient on deposits and reserves again. And so hopefully there's some robustness to be had. But it's going to be key to look at places where reserves and deposits are not super highly correlated. Um, I do want to emphasize, though, even if they're super highly correlated, it is impo important to try to get this to work out. Because if deposits are growing over time, it's not like the ECB can just say, look, our fit is great even if we kick out deposits. So just, just run the spread on reserves then you would get that reserve scarcity would kick in at a way lower level that is actually the case and you might end up with sort of a September 19 event. So it's difficult, but you know, I mean, maybe if there's some generality to the coefficient across jurisdictions, it would be helpful to start looking at what kind of elasticities do they get at the Bank of England? What kind of elasticity do we get at the Fed and other places, you know, where you can estimate it a little bit better uh, given the data. But thanks a lot for a very productive discussion. Thank you, Annette and Stefano. Um, let's open the floor for some questions, also for online participants. I see we have a question in the back. Hi, I'm um, Ansgar from Imperial College. Uh, I was wondering, the result at the end, the sort of September 19 result, if you, if you change the size your balance sheet too much, you struggle to hit your, your target rates. Should I think of that as a long-run steady state thing, so that trade-off is always there? Or could there be sort of some ratchet effect, you know, that all the markets, all the general equilibrium, all the asset markets you didn't model, et cetera, have gotten used to a big Fed? And so in the short run, if you try to push back against that, there's just a big adjustment cost and you start hitting that curvature. So both of them could kind of be consistent with your data because you're only estimating one demand curve. 
I'm wondering more broadly how, how you think about that. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, the key ingredient of your model is this convenience yield of uh, reserves. Now, the events of uh, last spring suggest that deposits are more volatile. You can have these sort of digital runs, which presumably increases the convenience yield of uh, reserves. But on the other hand, if you have the Fed stepping in as a lender of last resort, you don't need to have reserves because you can always borrow. So, I mean, there are these two forces that are going to make it difficult to use your estimated equations for the current environment, right? And yeah, maybe I abuse my, my role here and ask you a question about the distribution of reserves within the system. So, uh, do you, so, so you use aggregate data and uh, there, is, there is a concern, and I think part of that may have played out, at least part of the literature for uh, September 19 alludes to that, that um, it, it is, in fact, different parts of the banking system having a different level of reserves compared to their assets or compared to their deposits. And that might lead to situations where you start having the inflection in the demand curve uh, at a higher level than what macro estimates would suggest. So how, how, what would you respond to that? Maybe we should just take that first round. So uh, I think Anska's question in the back about uh, the ratchet effect. So this is, a, I think, sort of a general terminology for, for the idea that if you have more reserve supply than reserve demand, that sort of causally affects reserve demand as opposed to just moving the equilibrium, equilibrium along a given demand curve. Um, in this context, it sort of comes down to whether deposits went up because of QE, and there are sort of differing views on this, like Achara Rajan, I think uh, Viral is coming tomorrow to present an argument that there is this ratchet effect. I had argued that there's also a large role though for just deposits going up because household financial assets goes up, and uh, Will Diamond has a nice paper trying to quantify this out. Uh, people are kind of all over the place on this. I think it's still, a, it's still an open question. Um, whatever drives the increase in deposits. I think everyone agrees that if there's a lot of deposits, then there's going to be a lot of reserve demand. And so from a central banking perspective, in some sense, again, do you need to understand why the deposits came to exist? You know, possibly not. Um, then with respect to uh, Raphael's question about, you know, can, we, can the, uh, the March 2023 work fit into the, into the graphs? I think it fits quite well. Remember I had a graph where you have the supply goes up and then becomes flat and then you have a serve demand. And I said, if demand shifts out, then there's going to be borrowing in the discount window. Mm -hmm. So that fits right into the framework. And then as reserve demand shifts down, there's this sort of precautionary demand for holding more reserve due to high deposit volatility mm -hmm. you know, fades, then you, the whole thing works in reverse. So I think that works, that works fine. In terms of the distribution of reserves, I'm not sure if I could get a better fit. You know, if I had perfect data and I could model everyone's uh, reserve demands, I'm not sure that would help me. I think what you're giving me is a sort of a reason for where is the curvature coming from. It's that like the marginal bank is now really reluctant to change their reserve holdings. You know, but if anyone can think of ways to sort of incorporate the, the heterogeneity to actually get a better fit, you know, that's a good research area. Okay, I think. Thank you very much, Annette. Uh, I think we need to move to, to the second paper now. So, Sria, the, the, the floor is yours. You have also 25 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, first, please, uh, thank you so much to the conference organizers for accepting the paper into the program. We were very pleased um, to present this paper here today, especially with this terrific program and audience. Uh, this work is joint with Romina Ruprecht and Alyssa Anderson, uh, who are both at the board with me. Romina is actually in the audience. And Ethan Cohen, who is a first year PhD student at the University of Minnesota. And before I begin, the views expressed in this paper today are ours and should not be reflected as of the Federal Reserve Board or the Federal Reserve System. So the motivation for this paper actually came from our policy work. And that policy work, um, which Annette had talked about at length in her talk, was 
How has the Federal Reserve's new monetary policy framework, which is now called Ample Reserves, which I'll define a little bit later, how has it changed the demand for money in the financial system? So central banks, two tools usually, right, to do monetary policy. One is interest rates, and the other is the size of their balance sheet. And I would argue that the monetary policy transmission channels for interest rates are probably well known in the existing literature. Um, in the paper, we talk about two channels. Um, we call one the bank deposit channel, and the other we call the non-bank deposit channel. And in the bank deposit channel, that's in the uh, very familiar paper now by Dreschler, Schnabel, and Savov in the QJE 2017. And in that paper, they show that when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, that leads to a decline in bank deposits and lending. Now, then Kairong Xiao came along the RFS in 2020, and he asked, OK, well, if banks are losing deposits, where does that money go? And so he shows that when the Fed raises interest rates, that leads to a decline, uh, to an increase, excuse me, in non-bank deposits. And this is what we call the non-bank deposit channel. And when I talk about non-banks, I'm specifically referring to money market mutual funds. And so in this paper, we're going to ask, OK, so we know these two channels of monetary policy transmission for interest rates. Well, what about when the Federal Reserve uses its balance sheet? So specifically, how do banks and non-banks demand money when the Fed uses its balance sheet as a monetary policy tool? Specifically, we're thinking about quantitative tightening. So when the Federal Reserve is reducing the size of its balance sheet as it's doing now. And so we're going to write down and solve a structural model and then use that structural model, um, we're going to calibrate the model to the existing, to the current monetary policy tightening cycle. And then we're going to um, try to see if we can figure out what the equilibrium size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet should be, and indeed how much reserves there should be on the liability size of the Fed's balance sheet. And I'm going to put a disclaimer in now, reassuringly, we come to very similar estimates as Annette's paper. OK, so the, what we find are two main results. So we're going to show that the demand for money uh, by non-banks, that these money market mutual funds, and the capacity of the repo market to absorb this demand is actually going to be the first binding constraint on the size of the Fed's balance sheet, and not the demand for money or reserves by banks, which I think is a little bit different to what the existing literature has shown. And so once we, um, after we calibrate the model and then we run the model, at IORB, which is the interest on reserves that the Fed pays banks, at 4.65%, which it was in February of this year, um, we estimate that the Fed could reduce its balance sheet by about $2.3 trillion, which is consistent with Annette's work. And this is important because it's consistent with the Fed maintaining what we like to call as an ample reserve framework. So that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is that I think we show this kind of novel complementarity between the two monetary policy tools of interest rates and balance sheets. And we show that the higher the Fed sets its policy rate, we show that the smaller its balance sheet can be. And I will explain the mechanism driving that when I talk about the results of the model. So before I get into the model, I just want to briefly explain some how monetary policy is done at the Fed since we're at the ECB today. And Netta did already much of the work for me. So here is that red, the line that she, I think it was also read in her talk as well, which is just the demand for reserves by banks. So on the x-axis is I have reserves, and on the y-axis is I have price of reserves. And the Fed talks a lot now about what is called an ample reserve framework. This is the monetary policy framework that the FOMC is committed towards. And that's denoted by the blue vertical line, which I've noted as, as supply. And this is the idea that we're on the flat portion of the demand curve, so small changes in the quantity of reserves is not going to affect the price of reserves. But how can the Fed make sure that the price of reserves doesn't go to zero or below? And so now we've moved to an administered rate policy. So now we have two policy rates, which one is called the interest on reserve balances, which is essentially that's the um, interest that banks get when they put money at the Fed. And the second rate is called the ONRP rate, which is the overnight reverse repo facility rate, and that's the bottom um, dotted horizontal line, which is always going to be lower than the IORB rate. But economically, I like to think of the ONRP rate as the non-bank reserve interest rate. 
So it's the same thing as banks. They, Don banks can put money at the Fed and they get an interest rate. So it's the same thing economically. So right now, um, the reserves are around 3.3 trillion. And then what we're going to use the model for is, OK, what is x? And that's the vertical line. So essentially, how small can the Federal Reserve's balance sheet be that's still consistent with being in this ample reserve framework, meaning on the flat portion of the demand curve? And this is essentially what we're going to use the model for is to ask what the equilibrium size of the Fed's balance sheet should be, taking into account the demand for reserves by banks and the demand for non-bank reserves by these money market mutual funds. So before I also get into the model, I just wanted to also show what's been going on over the last year and a half. So the Federal Reserve started hiking interest rates in March 2022, and it lower, started declining the size of its balance sheet in June 2022. So on the x-axis here, I plotted from January 2022 till I think maybe last month. And I have three lines. The two takeaways are as follows. So the yellow line is bank reserves. But the yellow, uh, the blue line is what I like with the non-bank reserves. This is what is the take up at the overnight reverse repo facility. And the red line is repo volumes. I am specifically plotting overnight treasury repo, which Nana Winshin talked about at length. So the takeaway from this chart here is the red line has been going up, the blue line has been going down, but I would argue that the yellow line has stayed pretty flat. And this is over a period of monetary policy tightening with the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates and declining the size of the balance sheet. And these empirical observations, I think, are unique because, well, we think a lot about bank reserve demand, but we've been doing monetary policy tightening for about a, almost two years now, yet the yellow line has stayed flat. So the model is trying to capture what essentially the red line is doing, moving up, repo volumes, and the blue line going down, which is essentially non-bank demand for reserves at the Fed. So let's get into the model. So the model is built upon two papers, one by Rock Armenter and Ben Lester in 2017. Um, it's about the federal funds market. And then Kai Rong Xiao's 2020 RFS paper that illustrates the non-bank deposit channel. We have a two-period model and five types of agents. So we have banks, our non-banks, which are money market mutual funds, broker-dealers, households, and firms. We're going to have unit mass for each type of agent. And if you will, a sixth agent, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, which will implement monetary policy. So it's going to set the interest on reserves, which is denoted as capital R, the overnight reverse repo rate, which is lowercase r, and it's going to arrive in the model exogenously with a big balance sheet. So it's going to buy government bonds from households, which is BCB, and this model is really trying to understand quantitative tightening, and so that's why we exogenously make the central bank come in with a big balance sheet. So I'm not really going to show you much math here today. I find it very helpful to just show the T accounts of all the agents so uh, the mechanisms of the model hopefully are easily understood. So let me just first start with the central bank, which is in the top left. So on the asset side of the balance sheet, the bank, the central bank has bonds, treasury securities specifically in our model, a general good PX, which we have in the model to create a demand for money in the model. The liability side is twofold. Reserves, which is you know the bank, what, the cash held at the Fed by banks, and then the ONRP, which is the cash held at the Fed by the non-banks. Moving to banks, banks receive deposits DB, and they can invest in either loans or reserves. Money funds, which is the middle left, those are non-banks. They receive deposits. They also have two investments. They can either lend in repo markets, or put their money at the Fed with the ONRP. Now, households are the agent that's going to be deciding who gets the deposits. So they have equity in the model, and then they invest that equity in either bank deposits or money fund deposits. And obviously, how much do they decide to allocate between banks and money funds is going to be a function of the interest rate that banks give them versus the money funds give them. And then finally, we have dealers. And now dealers, they're going to be getting bonds, and they have to finance all of them in the repo market. And this is what's going to be creating the demand for financing in the repo market, because as the central bank is going to reduce the size of its balance sheet by reducing BCB, then that means that the dealers have to step in and buy those treasury securities, which means they have to finance them in the repo market. But before I get there, let me just quickly talk about the deposit market. 
As I mentioned, households will allocate their equity between banks and money funds, and that's going to be a function of the interest rate that either agent provides. So the bank deposit rate is going to be a function of capital R, capital R, which is the interest on reserves, that's how much they get for holding at the Fed, plus IL, which is the second term, that's how much they get on loans, the interest rate they get on loans, minus the monitoring costs. IDM, which is the interest rate that money funds provide, is going to be a function of rho, which is going to be the repo rate, minus some costs for them, such as the fees they might impose. And so the important thing in the model is that a pass-through of an increase in IORB, which is capital R, is going to be larger for the money fund deposit rate than for the bank deposit rate. And this is essentially the bank deposit channel and the non-bank deposit channel I talked about earlier. So this is very much so in the data. So as a result, in the model, because IDB is going to be less than IDM as R goes up, capital R goes up, that means that money is going to be flowing from bank deposits to money funds when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates. Now banks, their maximization functions as follows. They can either take that deposits that they get from the households and they can either invest in loans, which is the first term, minus those monitoring costs, or invest at the Fed and put them in reserves. So we're going to impose a constraint on banks, which is the delta in the second line. And that delta is trying to capture, uh, it's a, it's, the delta is a minimum reserves to deposit ratio that we impose in the model. And this is to make sure that banks hold reserves because Federal Reserve no longer has reserve requirements. But the delta is also there to kind of capture things that we, I think was just talked about in the previous paper, the fact that some banks just have some preferences for holding lots of reserves that we just don't understand. And they might be re related to some regulatory ratios, such as the LCR and SLR. There's preferences to hold safe assets. Now let's move on to non-banks and the repo markets, the money funds. So now the money funds, they also have two investments. They receive deposits from the households, but they can either lend in the repo market and receive RO, or lend their deposits at the ONRP at the Fed. And that interest rate is lowercase r. So how is demand for liquidity, and what is, how is that driven in the model? So the demand for liquidity is, comes from the broker-dealers in our model. And that demand is created as the Federal Reserve reduces the size of its balance sheet by reducing the amount of bonds on its balance sheet. The dealers must finance those bonds in the repo market. And so that de that's the demand in the repo market, but the supply of cash in the repo market is going to come from the money funds. And that's also determined by the money funds maximization problem. And so the money funds are going to decide how they're going to allocate those deposits. And that's going to be a function of, okay, what's the repo rate, which is going to be a function of the demand for financing by those dealers. That's the first term. And then the second term is essentially how much they would get in interest at the ONRP. So we, saw, we uh, write down the model, and we solve the model, and we get two equilibriums. I'm just going to go over the equilibriums now. So the first equilibrium is what we call the excess liquidity equilibrium, which is also, you can think of as the ample reserves equilibrium uh, for the ample reserves framework that the Federal Reserve is currently in. That equilibrium is characterized as follows. So the demand for liquidity by dealers in the repo market is low. The Federal Reserve is still reducing the size of its balance sheet, but the demand that dealers need to finance those bonds is low relative to the liquidity that money funds have in deposits. And so that's going to mean that rho, which is the repo rate that money funds can lend to, is going to be equal to the overnight reverse repo rate. And because they're equal, that means that the money funds are just going to put all of their money at the Fed instead. The second equilibrium is what we like to call the scarce liquidity equilibrium. And so that means now that the repo rate is greater than R. There's enough demand in the repo markets by dealers to finance those treasury bond holdings that leads to an increase in the repo rates so money funds adjust by taking money from the ONRP and lending in the repo market instead, leading to rho, which is greater than R, and that means that there is no more take up or investment or non-bank reserves at the Fed. Because of these two equilibriums, then we back up what we like to call a critical threshold of central bank holdings, which we call BCB tilde. And this is the level right at the tipping point where you go from excess liquidity to scarce liquidity, such that the repo rate is going to be equal to the ONRP rate, that's the rate that non-banks get at the Fed, but ONRP take up, the amount of 
non-bank reserves at the Fed is going to be zero. And so this is the threshold, this is the minimum size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet that's consistent with an excess liquidity re regime. It's that tipping point, point going from excess liquidity to scarce liquidity. And you can think of, I'm trying to back up that X, which is that vertical dash line I showed you in the background slide. That's the smallest balance sheet the Fed can have that's consistent with an ample reserve framework. So before I go into some of the results, I'm just going to go through the mechanisms one more time in the T accounts. So these T accounts hopefully are a bit familiar, but now this is what's going on. So in the excess liquidity regime, as the Federal Reserve is reducing the size of its balance sheet, you can see BCB going down. But if I quickly go into the money funds, now they're allocating less towards the ONRP, which is those non-bank reserves, and more into repo. Now from the dealers, you can see here that the BD, the amount of bonds that they need to finance is going up, and they're finance that, financing that in the repo market. This is where the fun stuff occurs. And the scarce liquidity regime, again, the central banks on the asset side, the, federal, the bonds that the Federal Reserve holds, it's going down. But now this is where the households come in. So now um, the, the households are going to be adjusting the deposits they have from banks towards money funds. Why? So as the central bank is reducing the size of the, its balance sheet by reducing the amount of treasury securities it holds, that's creating demand for financing by the dealers. Right? You can see their T account, the asset side and the liability side is going up. This is putting pressure upwards on the repo rate, rho, which is now going to be above the ONRP rate, which is the non-bank reserve rate. And so money funds are therefore going to start shifting money from the ONRP and into repo. And since now rho is now going up and is greater than R, they can then give a better interest rate to the household. So IDM, the interest rate that they can offer to the households, is now going up a lot more than IDB, which is the interest rate that banks can offer. And this is causing households to adjust their deposits by moving from banks to households. Okay, so we write down the model, we solve it, and then we calibrate it to the current monetary policy tightening cycle, which we, is from September 15, 2021, which is the peak level of reserve balances on the Fed's balance sheet to the end of last year. And so we're going to calibrate the model to match several moments. The first is rho, the repo rate. We're going to be looking at the overnight tri-party general collateral, right? So this is the GC market overnight against treasury repo. Aggregate bank deposits. The interest rate on bank deposits and money fund deposits, which is, um, and then aggregate owner P take up, which is the amount of non-bank reserves at the Fed, and then aggregate reserves, which is the amount of bank reserves at the Fed. And we also have some independent parameters in the model, so we're going to be putting in the, pol the current policy rates, so the average over this period is 1.38, 1.28. We're going to be uh, putting in the average interest rate on banks outside investments. So this IL is like the loan interest rate on what banks get if they were not to invest in reserves. We take this from the call reports, and so this is essentially a volume weighted average of loans and securities that banks can hold. We put in how much secu treasury securities are held at the Fed, how much treasury securities exist in the economy, and then this is that delta is that minimum reserve to deposit ratio, which is one incentivizes banks to hold reserves and is trying to proxy for these preferences for banks to hold reserves because of regulatory ratios. So how do we do? So here is the model after we calibrate it and then we run it for the February 2023 FOMC where the Federal Reserve did hike interest rates. And I think we do pretty well. So the repo rate, we match pretty well. Um, the interest rate on money fund deposits, bank deposits, Aggregate ONRP, again, which is that non-bank reserves, aggregate reserves, I think we do really pretty well. What we don't do well is the interest rate on bank deposits. We predict um, 18 basis points when in, uh, sorry, we predict 3.28% when in reality it's 18 basis points. So if you have any takeaway in this entire presentation, if you have any money invested in the US, please make sure it's not in a bank and you put it in a money market fund. And this is a bit of a puzzle. So. Um, I think you know, when we looked at a lot, a lot of other structural model papers, this seems to be something very hard for a lot of papers to model pretty well. Um, it's a bit of a puzzle why households keep all their money in banks. But we do a lot of robustness in the paper to make sure it's not driving our results. And speaking of results, let me talk about them. <laughs> 
So the first result is that we claim that the capacity of the repo market and this demand for money by non-banks is going to bind before reserve demand. So this graph here, on the x-axis, we have capital R, which is the interest on reserves. And on the y-axis, we just we back out the equilibrium level of reserves. And so we're doing it here for 4.65%, which is um, what, at that time what we uh, calculated the model for. But now we know that R is like five and a quarter. So the blue dotted line, you can think of it anything above that line, that we're in the excess liquidity equilibrium. Anything below the blue dotted line, we're in the scarce liquidity equilibrium. The yellow line is what we backed out as actual bank reserve demand. So we in the paper say, OK, if you're in the Federal Reserve, if you want to reduce the size of your balance sheet to BCB tilde, which is that critical level of the central bank's balance sheet where we go from that excess liquidity to scarce liquidity, that's the blue dashed line, which would equate to about $3.2 trillion in reserves. But if you were to ignore that and just think about bank reserve demand, that would go down to about $2.1 trillion of reserves, which is you know, a big difference. And that's fine, right? Because the Federal Reserve, OK, you're only monitoring banks. You're only supervising banks. That's you typically what you think of. That's fine. But what the red dotted line shows, that if you were to reduce the amount of reserves past the red dotted line, that indicates then that the repo rate would start to become much, much higher than the Federal Reserve's policy rates. And since the federal funds rate, which is the rate that the Federal Reserve typically uh, controls, tip follows the repo rate and not the other way around, we argue that if, you, if the Fed were to reduce the amount of reserves on its balance sheet past the red dotted line, that's when the Fed would start to lose interest rate control. So this is why we argue in the paper that it's really this capacity of the repo market and the non-bank reserve demand that is going to be the first binding constraint on the size of the Fed's balance sheet, at least to maintain interest rate control, rather than just thinking about bank reserve demand alone. And then the next natural question might be, well, why, why does the capacity of the repo market matter? Is it an actual friction? So um, Adam, Daryl, and David Yang have a paper that showed that reserve balances reached an all-time low on September 16, 17, 2019. It was also mentioned, I think, several talks here today. We argue that, OK, yes, reserves also reached an all-time low on that day. But we also argue that this friction, this capacity of the repo market of dealers being able to finance those treasury securities also started to bind on that day. And we run the model using our calibrated model, uh, calibrated values to predict what the model would have said happened on September 16th, 2019. And I think we do pretty well. So we do get that spike in row, which is the repo rate, and we are able to match bank deposits, aggregate ONRP take up, and aggregate reserves. Again, we're not able to match the interest rate on bank deposits well again, but I think this is always a little bit of a puzzle in the literature. So another takeaway, perhaps, from this paper is that, yes, reserves reached an all-time low on September 16th, 17, 2019, but there were also frictions in the repo market that played an important role contributing to that repo spike. And that was due to the non-bank demand for money. The second result is this complementarity between this fact that um, as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates more, then that means that the equilibrium size of the balance sheet can decline more as well. And the mechanism behind that is because as the Federal Reserve increases interest rates, money funds can offer a better rate to households. They are able to invest more money into the repo market, which is, allows to cater to that extra dealer demand to finance those treasury securities the Fed no longer holds. So in conclusion, we show in this paper there is also a deposit channel of monetary policy as the Fed does quantitative tightening and that non-banks have an important role in determining how the Federal Reserve does monetary policy implementation in terms of quantitative tightening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sria. Rafael, you have 15 minutes for your discussion. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, this is not an easy paper to uh, discuss, but uh, I, I must say that I learned a lot uh, reading this paper. Okay, now everybody knows that. Uh, sorry, what, what happened? Can I have the slides back? Okay, right. 
So, uh, since the global financial crisis, uh, central banks have combined these uh, conventional interest rate tools with these uh, unconventional quantitative tools, QE and QT. And uh, so they've gone from a uh, scarce to an ample reserve regime. So the policy rate becomes the interest rate on bank reserves. Now, uh, the paper addresses a key issue in monetary policy implementation. Uh, I think that this is something that here in Frankfurt they are sort of studying carefully. What are the effects and the limits of QT? How do, you, how do they compare with uh, changes, increases in the policy rate? The paper incorporates uh, institutional features of the U.S. financial system, in particular this uh, uh, behavior of banks and non-banks, money market mutual funds, and also these institutional features of Fed monetary policy, the distinction between the interest rate on reserve balances and the overnight reverse repo rate, the on RRP. The main results, uh, in my view, are the following. For a given policy rates and ample reserves, QT mainly affects reserves of non-banks. The limits of QT, therefore, depend on the holdings of reserves by non-banks, and this is the way in which you can uh, understand the title, Stop Believing in Bank Reserves, because uh, the heart of the matter is what happens to the non-banks, not to the banks. The second result is that uh, a switch to the scarce reserve regime depends on the policy rates, uh, or the policy rates, and you can have more QT with higher rates. So these are the main results of the paper. Now, the paper is structured as follows. There are some aggregate time series evidence, there is a theoretical model, there is a calibration, and then there is uh, the discussion of the results. I have uh, four main comments uh, uh, which are in this slide. First, I think that this is an ambitious paper on a very important topic for central banks. And let me add that uh, I have found surprising that uh, there hasn't been that much research, uh, not by academics, for them this is very far away from their interest, uh, but inside central banks. And we are thinking about this during the QT, but what about QE? I mean, you had many years and where are the papers, right? Okay, now the paper, in a way, seems work in progress. Uh, the results are very promising, but I think that there is uh, a fair amount of polishing that needs to be done. In my view, the theoretical model has too many, what I call, peculiar features that I will describe in a minute, and this is going to be the focus of my discussion. And finally, I think that uh, this, I couldn't resist saying that this aggregate time series evidence doesn't add anything. Uh, this is visual correlations of endogenous variables. Please don't do that anymore. I think that this is becoming very popular, but it doesn't tell you anything. Okay, let me just briefly summarize the theoretical model. These two periods, five types of private agents, the household firms, banks, non-banks, and dealers, plus the government and central bank. Households have an initial endowment and then invest in bank and non-bank deposits. The firms are going to produce and sell consumption goods to the households, and households can only pay firms with bank deposits, so there is a, like a cash in advance type of uh, demand for uh, bank deposits. The banks are funded with uh, household deposits. There is no equity capital. They invest in reserves and loans to other unnamed uh, agents. Uh, they are subject to linear balance sheet costs, uh, subject to a reserve requirement. And on the other hand, the non-banks are funded also by households deposits. They invest in reserves and loans to dealers, and they are subject to linear balance sheet costs. The dealers are funded by the non-banks, and they are going to invest in government debt. Okay, that's the nutshell the model. Uh, oh yes, there is a central bank that uh, says the total amount of reserves held by banks and non-banks. The interest on reserve by banks, let me deviate from your notation. Uh, I, I, I prefer to use in the small r for interest rates, net interest rates. rb is the interest rate on banks uh, paid by uh, bank reserves and rn is the interest rate uh, on reserves by non-banks. And of course, there is a gap, currently 10 basis points between the two rates. Okay. Peculiar features of the model. In the model, there are two types of goods. There are, there's a general good, which is produced by the government, the central bank, and there's a special good produced by firms. Okay, well, I mean, central banks producing goods is not something that I find most appealing, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a theorist, okay? I'm, I'm willing to do almost anything, but uh, I mean, this is... Uh, Second, the uh, determination of deposit rates is obtained by bilateral bargaining uh, between banks and depositors. I think that this is probably an unnecessary complication. And finally, there is an exogenous fixed loan spread, which hopefully could be uh, endogenized uh, properly. 
The second comment uh, is that I think that there are some unnecessary elements. The dealers are funded by non-banks and they invest in debt. So I guess that you could assume that non-banks could directly invest in government debt and you kill the dealers. They don't play any uh, role in the setup. Banks' reserve requirements don't play any role. Uh, they are calibrated to a very high level, 13%, because of this is the September 2019. So again, not uh, really essential. Uh, what I think are missing elements is lending to banks by non-banks. Uh, banks issuing commercial paper that uh, is funded by non-banks, and this is an important adjustment mechanism, not in the model. Leverage constraints for banks. I think that this is also some important missing element. You should have some way of limiting borrowing uh, by banks from non-banks. Otherwise, there's an arbitrage opportunity because of the gap between the two policy rates. Uh, and uh, otherwise, non-banks would not keep any reserves. They would move all the reserves to the banks and the banks would get the higher uh, policy rate. So what am I going to do in the remaining nine minutes? I'm going to sketch, it's only a sketch, a simpler theoretical model that yields similar results. The ingredients is there's a conventional central bank doesn't produce any goods. There's households with bank deposits in the utility function. Uh, there's a local monopoly banks setting loan and deposit rates, and there is competitive non-banks. This is the, okay. So uh, again, uh, two periods, uh, I kill the dealers. Uh, Households have an initial endowment, they invest in bank and non-bank deposits, and firms are going to be borrowing from banks to produce output. The banks are monopolists uh, with respect to households and firms. These are local monopolies. There is an well, economy-wide uh, market for um, uh, other assets. They borrow from households and possibly non-banks. Uh, they invest in reserves and loans to firms, and they are subject to a leverage ratio which puts us an upper bound on asset side. This is important, as I argued before. The non-banks are competitive. They borrow from household. They invest in reserve, government debt, and loans to the banks. So and I'm going to focus on the ample reserves regime. So this is, would be the balance sheet of the non-banks, reserves. I I'll, uh, have the government bonds. Remember that I have uh, killed the dealers and loans to banks, which is the new feature. And then on the liability side, they have these deposits with a sub-index N, because these are the non-banks. So if uh, the amount of reserves is positive, a zero profit condition, remember that they are competitive, would imply that the deposit rate is equal to the bond rate, is equal to the loan rate, and is equal to the interest on reserves. That obviously, of course, uh, simplifies a lot the analysis. Balance sheet of non-banks, you have deposits and borrowing from the non-banks, reserves and loans to firms on the asset side. And of course, if the, uh, there is a gap between the two policy rates, the upper bound on asset side is going to be binding. Otherwise, there will be an arbitrage opportunity. So, so you know, the sum of reserves plus loans to the firms is going to be equal to this upper bound. So, um, okay. Uh, so, so of course, uh, if they borrow from uh, the non-banks at the uh, on RRP, uh, they are going to be making a small profit, uh, and this could be considered a subsidy to the banks. Equilibrium loan and deposit rates, the interest on reserves is the opportunity cost of loans, uh, and the equilibrium loan rate, it would be something like that. The loan rate it maximizes the spread between the loan rate and the opportunity cost multiplied by the downward sloping demand for loans, and that would be the equilibrium loan rate. The equilibrium deposit rate is obtained uh, in the analogous manner. The spread between the uh, marginal revenue of deposit, which is the RB, and the deposit rate, and of course, in the in the case of the deposits, the demand, uh, the household supply of deposits depends on both the interest that they get with the banks and the interest that they get from the non-banks, which is higher, right? Okay, what is the effect of QT on banks? Well, loan rates and loan quantities only depend on the interest rate on bank reserves. If you keep the interest rate on bank reserves, there's going to be no effect on, 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 on on, on, on deposit rates and deposit quantities, and there's going to be no effect on loan rates and loan quantities. So QT doesn't have any effect on banks in this simplified version. What about uh, uh, non-banks? Well, QT only affects the size of the balance sheet of the non-banks. Reserves go down, uh, government bonds go up. This is the open market operation in, uh, involved in QT. And therefore, no change in household deposits or in loans to banks. QT is neutral. It doesn't have any real effects in this simplified model. Okay.
Limits of QT, well, given these two policy rates, QT can proceed as long as the amount of reserves held by the non-banks is positive. So it's basically the same result as the paper. The limits of QT depend on the holdings of reserves by non-banks. Stop believing in bank reserves. That's the key message that uh, I take it from the paper, which is in the title. What about, I mean, I'm going to play around with changes in interest rate, but I'm going to split. I'm going to say, okay, what happens if we increase the interest rate on reserves of the non-banks? Now, if the amount of uh, non-bank reserves is positive, the zero profit condition stays the same as before. And so an effect of an increase in RN for a fixed RB is that you are going to be a shift from bank to non-bank deposits. Uh, and this is going to increase uh, in non-bank lending to the banks because nothing is going to happen on the bank's side. So this is the, for the non-banks, the deposits go up, uh, no change in reserves is going to these additional funds are going to be reloaned to the banks, no change in reserves. And in the case of the banks, deposits go down, they shift to the non-banks and the non-banks recycle these funds back to the banks. And therefore, this would be the change uh, in, in the effect of a change in the deposit rate of the, the reverse repo facility. What happens if you change the interest on reserve balances? Well, the uh, two first order conditions that I uh, didn't write before, but you can uh, derive very easily, imply that loan and deposit rates are going to go up. This is going to reduce bank loans. It's going to increase in bank deposits. It's going to lead to an increase in bank reserves because of the you have smaller loans, so you, you, you just fill the gap with uh, additional reserves, and it's going to have an ambiguous effect on bank profits. So this is what happens. Deposits go up, loans to firms go down, given the upper bound on the bank's balance sheet because of the arbitrage opportunities, reserves are going to go up, and the loans by the non-banks are going to go down. So no change in the size of balance sheet. And in the case of the non-banks, deposits go down, and all these funds are going to be uh, 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 going to be translated into reduced loans to the banks. So because of the shift from non-bank to bank deposits. Okay. Finally, what happens? This is the exercise done in the paper. If both rates increase by the same amount at the same time. Well, the balance sheet of the banks, first deposits go down, loans to firms go down, but now there is a, there is a difference since, the, I mean, there is no change in the size of the balance sheet by the leverage constraints, so reserves must go up, and therefore the banks have to borrow more from the non-banks. And in the case of the balance sheet of the non-banks, what happens is that deposits go up, loans to the banks go up because of the shift from bank to non-bank deposit. Remember that. The, the, the bank deposit market is not competitive. So the deposit rate stays. This is one of the puzzles in your <laughs> at basically zero, whereas the non-banks go up. So therefore, that uh, moves uh, uh, households from uh, banks to non-banks. And, uh, and so there's going to be a reduction in reserves if total reserve uh, to be unchanged, because this is just a pure uh, changes in interest rate. OK, so summing up, uh, this uh, alternative model that I have sketched, I think avoids some of the shortcomings of the theoretical model in the paper. It yields similar results, in particular the fact that limits of QT depend on the holding of reserves by the non-banks. The alternative model yields some contrasting results. So if you increase both the policy rates, it's going to reduce uh, um, um, non-bank reserves, and therefore it, it leaves less room for QT with higher rates. So this is the opposite result, but of course the model is different, so you wouldn't be surprised that this, you get a different result. OK, just to conclude, last two slides. First, I think that, as I said at the beginning, the paper addresses a key issue from a novel perspective, incorporating these uh, institutional features about the US financial system and the uh, Fed monetary policy. I think that there are many interesting questions to be addressed with this type of uh, model. The effect of, uh, for example, equating the two policy rates, the interaction between monetary policy and bank regulation. Remember the key role in my uh, model of the limit to the uh, size of the bank's balance sheet. Obviously, in a place like this, differences with ECB's uh, monetary policy implementation. And, um, but I think that, to conclude, I think that much more research is needed. Uh, I mean, it is my bias, but I think that theoretical contributions would be especially welcome. And let me just conclude with uh, something that, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, should be uh, a sentence very familiar to all of you. Uh, I think that we need richer models. 
Uh, the simple models of these two periods, like the one that I have uh, sketched, cannot address Bernanke's conundrum. The problem with quantitative easing or quantitative tightening is that it works in pra practice, but it doesn't work in theory. In these type of models, QT is neutral, doesn't have any effects on real variables. So in order to get real effects, you have to think about the effect of QT or QE on credit spreads, on uh, term spreads, on sovereign spreads, whatever. I mean, you must have models that have much more heterogeneity across time or across other dimensions uh, in the economy. So there's a, there's a big amount of work to be done uh, on these matters. Also, oh, thank you very much. very much, Rafael. So yeah, would you like to come back to some of the points made by Professor Rupert? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for that excellent discussion and the model it makes us think, which definitely will make, make sure that all our results are robust. I think the one thing, and I might have gotten this wrong, is that I think your model doesn't have a repo market. And I think that was one of the channels that we wanted to show and that the capacity of the repo market is also a friction on the size of the Fed's balance sheet, but I think your point yeah. is well taken that. But, but, but the repo, uh, it is in the model, but it operates only through the banks. Right. You, you, yeah. need, you need, I mean, the banks should be there, but perhaps there are other agents that are also trading with the non-banks in the repo market, and that, that's not there. Yeah, we, we have gotten that feedback before to combine the banks and the dealers, and we'll, we'll revisit that. The reason we kept it separately is so that because we were like dealers don't hold reserves, so it's nice to keep them separate from like from a thinking perspective. Um, and also, your point is well taken on that the model doesn't have any um, real side implications. Um, yeah, but yeah, thank you very much for that. I will definitely need your slides. <laughs> okay, so <Excellent>. let's. <laughs> We're already past, past the loaded time, but let's maybe take one or two questions. And Aneta, so you would like to? I just had a clarifying thing to let's, I don't want to cut out the questions. Any, any other questions? OK, let's take those, please. Hi, I'm Christian Kubica, ECB. Thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. Very much enjoyed it. Um, I'm trying to think, or I'm trying to wrap my head around how I th should think about your paper in relation to the first paper that we saw today. Because your paper basically argues we should first increase rates, and then we are able to do quantitative tightening. The mm -hmm. first paper today argued that um, quantitative, um, that we should do first do quantitative tightening in order to reduce scarcity effects that prevent monetary policy transmission. So what should we do first, conventional or unconventional monetary policy? And maybe the difference is related to the different institutional setup because we don't have the reverse repo facility uh, in, in the euro area. So do you think that's the main uh, reason for this difference in perspective or is there something else um, behind it? Um, we're very curious to hear what you think about that. Thanks. Maybe let's take that fi final question from the gentleman there. Hi, uh, Miguel Jarry from Banque de France. I'm a co-author of the first paper, but I'm not going to take your question for sure. <laughs> I'm going to uh, let someone else answer this very difficult point. So um, I think your paper to me is the first one which really provides us an explanation of what happened in September uh, 19 other than scarcity of reserves. And I think your point is more that what was going on is more on the repo market side. I think it's very, uh, I think it's very welcome. Lots of people had these, you know, intuitions, discussions, but nobody could watch through it. So now my question is, if we want to go further and to try to uh, empirically uh, tr kind of try to discriminate between scarcity of reserves or excess of bonds, um, would you have any idea of whether by looking at the Fed funds market versus the repo market and the fact that, as we saw also in the keynote speech today, the repo market spiked up much more than other money market rates. Is there anything you can exploit there to convince us that it's not reserve scarcity, but actually what's going on in the bond market, which triggered uh, that spike? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Annette, would you still like to make your clarifying? Yeah, so just clarifying the links. So. Remember the picture I had with the reserve demand, and then I said, you're going to get an ONRP takeoff if there's too much supply relative to demand. So if you, in that context, lower supply, at first, dollar for dollar, you're just going to get a reduction in ONRP takeoff. But then at some point, you're going to start seeing the Fed funds rate lift off and, the, and you know, so for lift off the floor. 
So um, I think we're actually in complete agreement that the point at which the ONRP hits zero is going to happen before you start seeing substantial curvature, you know, and that's also what happened in the last QT, right, that you saw the ONRP goes to zero, you know, quite a lot before September 19. So in that sense, um, you know, there's no contrast. I also just want to remind you, remember when I took the first order condition, I said, there's many different first order conditions we could do. You could borrow in many different ways, including in repo, to invest in reserves. You know, so it's not like there's like different first order conditions for one and the other. It's just like there's like a reserve demand curve relative to repo. And in that sense, it, I think it all, it, it all is pretty consistent. I would agree. I think one thing, I, I thought your paper also said that you would recommend intri increasing interest rates first and then doing quantitative tightening, or do you make a statement on the sequence? Because that's the important in our paper. Um, I mean, so that is, if you increase interest rate, I mean, the key thing is whether you want to manipulate deposits, right? If you start moving the interest rate, then you're going yeah. to get all the interesting effects that's of like money flowing from one to yeah, the other exactly. one. And so, I think but yeah, that's an important result of our model in the sense that we do recommend that you have to increase interest rates first in order to have room to reduce the balance sheet. So, and I think also the, the second part of that question was um, the difference between ECB. So this is very much a learning trip for me because I, I think that money market mutual funds and non-banks are not as much of a player here um, as it is at the Fed So in the US. So I think when the Federal Reserve increased the size of its balance sheet significantly during the COVID pandemic, that, I think that's really when we saw a lot of this non-bank demand for money. And I would argue that bank reserve demand kind of got saturated at that point because the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was already very, very big. So maybe, and maybe I'm speculating, there could be a point where non-banks do start playing a lot big of a role in the ECB if the balance sheet did get very, very large and the ECB started providing essentially a tool like the ONRP um, here. So that would be my, that would, but I think there, that's the biggest difference is the ONRP between the Fed and the ECB. And then the second question, which was empirically being able to disentangle the scarcity of reserves versus the capacity of dealer balance sheets in September 2019. Yeah, I think that's very hard. I think both are at play. I don't know which bound first. And I, I, I think that's a very interesting question that I have to think about how we could ever exploit that empirically. Thank you for that, though. Rafael. Well, I mean, this is a point about the sequencing. Now, inflation shoots up. The Fed, or the, central, the European Central Bank, has to tighten monetary policy. There's no question about that. QT is doing nothing for uh, So therefore, you have to raise interest rates. I mean, the, I mean, all these discussions are an academic discussion. Interest rates must go first. And then, of course, you want to do the other stuff for other reasons. But I mean, in terms of the policy issue, I mean, it's, it's not clear. Uh, it is very clear, uh, the sequencing that you have to follow. Thank you also for this uh, very clear advice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and with this, uh, we, we conclude this session. Uh, we, the conference will reconvene at half past three with a very exciting market uh, panel. So I, uh, I strongly encourage everyone to come back also uh, virtually. And in the meantime, uh, please join me in uh, thanking and uh, congratulating the speakers. <laughs>